Hey everybody, welcome back to Purple Fit Photography. Today we're gonna to be discussing some of the biggest pieces of advice when it comes to taking amazing photos. One of the biggest issues that I see people facing a lot of the time is not being able to master their exposure. Photos that are too bright or too dark, or if you're facing an issue where your photos don't retain as much detail as you had hoped for, even though you felt like you had the lighting correct. Well, be sure to stick around because I'm gonna be showing you guys my biggest tips when it comes to nailing your exposure. So before we begin, for those of you that are new here, my name is Matt. I make weekly videos giving you guys photo tutorials, drone tips, as well as sharing my knowledge with all of you. So subscribe if you'd like to see more. So let's start out with the basics. First off, let's talk about what exposure is exactly. Obtaining light through your camera sensor is the only way to give your camera information to collect data on your photo. Your camera has the ability to change the way that it takes in this light. There are two functions that control how much light your camera sees. One is by using longer shutter speeds, which will change how fast your camera opens and closes your sensor, allowing for more time for the light to reach the sensor. The second is aperture, which is the adjustable lens opening that adjusts the amount of light in your photo and also changes the focal point. Like I said before, obtaining light is crucial for you to be able to get as much data as you can for each photo to be able to tweak and post. Now you may be wondering, what about the ISO? Here's the thing about ISO. Even though ISO does change the brightness of a photo, it's only doing this through the camera software, not the hardware of your camera. So because it's changing the lighting of your photo digitally, this causes noise to appear in your photo. Now, since ISO still affects your photo's brightness, we're still going to be talking about how changing the ISO will also help with the exposure of your photos. Just keep in mind that the actual definition of exposure when it comes to photography only talks about aperture and shutter speed. While you can get a rough idea of your photo's exposure just by looking at your camera's viewfinder or your screen, there is a much more accurate way to assess exposure, which is by using your histogram. This handy tool visually presents the brightness levels of each pixel in your image. Think of it as a graphical snapshot of your photo's brightness. Dark tones are shown here, lighter tones over here, and the middle tones right here. Now, if your photo is too bright, all of your data is going to be shown to the right. The right side of your histogram represents the brightest tones that your camera will be able to record. If you touch the right edge of your photo, this is what is called blown out. If you touch the left hand edge, it will be pure black. Now for all of my photos, I use Lightroom as my post editing software, even to make the smallest adjustments. With the histogram over here, I can slide the exposure slider up and down, which as you can see will make the histogram go right and left. You want to be careful here as you can seriously cause a great photo to become completely crushed or blown out. Now it's not to say that using black and whites can't make for amazing shots, like this one I took of an eagle soaring over a lake. The contrast between the two still provides the photo with enough balance to retain its original detail. However, many photographers will tell you that it's ideal to keep the data between both sides of your histogram. There is an idea that the tip of the histogram needs to be centered, which isn't always true. Dark images are going to have a peak to the left and bright images will have a peak to the right. So first off, let's get the histogram to show up on your camera. On a mirrorless camera, the histogram can be seen right in your viewfinder. On a DSLR, you need to put your camera into live view mode and you can do this by pressing this button. On a Canon, hit the info button until the histogram shows up on your display. On a Sony, hit display. On a Nikon, press info. And on a Fuji, you can enable it in your custom settings menu. If your histogram isn't showing up, you may have to go into your camera settings through your camera menu. Now here I have set up my camera to show you guys exactly how the histogram works. To better demonstrate this, I'm using EOS Utility on my computer. This comes stock with all Canon cameras. So here we have three different variables that affect the brightness of your photo. Shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. What you want to do is put your camera into manual mode and choose two of these variables to start out with then one of the variables to adjust if needed. For example, when I take photos of stars, I use a wide aperture and a long shutter speed. Then I use my ISO to be my tweak step because too much ISO can cause the image to be flooded with noise. A better example of this is when the light is generous and my subject isn't moving. A low ISO of 100 is typically where I would be if it's a sunny day or if you're in a room with a good amount of light. Now for this, I'd like a thin depth of field on this Koya toy here, so my focal is set to 2.8. Now I've left the shutter speed as my last variable. 
Your shutter speed dial will now be what you use to adjust your exposure easily. You can see that at this shutter speed I'm at right now, the image is going to be way too dark. So in order to brighten the photo, you need to lengthen the shutter speed to get more light on your camera sensor. You want to do this until the data on your histogram is generally in the middle. Now I don't care what the shutter speed is in this scenario, so I make it whatever is needed. But shutter speed can play a huge part in your photos, especially when it comes to wildlife photography and being able to capture a moving subject. But we'll touch more on that in a little bit. Now let's say shooting at 1 100th of a second for my shutter is what I want for a sharp subject, and I don't care too much about the blurriness of the background. You can then use your aperture as your last variable. This is where those F numbers come into play. High F numbers will close your camera sensor and make the image darker, whereas larger apertures will do the opposite and make the image brighter. As you can see, I adjust the aperture until the data is where I want it to be. So as I was saying before, I need high shutter speed so that I can freeze my subjects, and this can get a bit tricky. Having your shutter speed too high can cause the image to be too bright. If this is the case, don't fret. Later in this video I will show you how brighter photos can actually be better than photos that are too dark. Now if the ISO is getting to be too high and I can't get the image to be the right brightness, then I need to lower the shutter speed to let in more light. Most cameras come equipped with multiple different settings including shutter priority, aperture priority, and manual with auto ISO. These settings are huge because they basically do all the work for you. Your camera will be begging to focus on getting your image to stay in the 18% gray area, which is almost like the middle of your histogram. However, cameras aren't perfect and it may not always get this right. Have you ever wondered what this was? Well, it might just be your new friend. Meet Exposure Compensation. This is the dial that you will use to adjust the exposure to where you think is best. Now with shutter priority, or TV, you have chosen that the shutter speed is what you want to control, and you want the camera to take care of the rest. So you'll pick the shutter speed and ISO, and the camera will pick the aperture for you. Then if you're not quite happy enough with the results, you can use the exposure compensation dial to get it right. Now it's the same idea if you shoot an aperture priority, AV. That means that the aperture in the ISO is what you're going to be controlling and the camera will take care of the shutter speed. And then just like before, use the exposure compensation as a last resort. Now if you shoot in manual with auto ISO, which is perfect for wildlife photography, you can set the shutter speed and the aperture and then let the camera set the ISO. This allows you to have much more time to be able to plan your shots and not have to worry about setting the ISO correctly. Now a really good way to get the best quality from your photos is to use a method called expose to the right. This means exposing your photo just enough for the camera to record as much data as possible without it becoming too bright for the camera to capture. Your histogram should be as far to the right as possible without completely touching the right side. Here is why this works. Digital camera sensors record data in a way that the brighter areas actually have more of an ability to record the data than darker areas. Photos that are darker have less data, and vice versa. Shooting a photo too dark and raising the exposure and processing makes the photo noise more apparent, whereas the opposite, shooting too bright, actually makes the noise less apparent, especially in shadowy areas. This is only going to work best if you use the aperture and shutter speed to move the histogram right, rather than the ISO, because as we've discussed earlier in the video, ISO doesn't manually change your image's brightness and will actually cause more noise. Also, make sure that you shoot in RAW. Yes, it does take up more memory on your card, and it will take a while to transfer the photos to the computer, but if you shoot in JPEG, your camera may completely undo everything that you worked so hard for, because JPEG files don't carry nearly as much data as RAW files do. Now, with all of this being said, your images are going to need to be edited later in post, because obviously they are going to be way too bright. But the benefit is, is that you'll have more data to play with in a minimal amount of noise. Now, all of this stuff about exposure wouldn't be helpful if we didn't talk about drone photography as well. The principles of exposure, including shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, apply to aerial drone photography just as much. When you're flying your drone, you're often dealing with a wide range of lighting conditions. For instance, the light can change dramatically when you change altitude or direction, or when clouds move across the sun. Just like with ground-based photography, getting the right exposure in drone photography is about balancing shutter speed, aperture, and ISO to achieve the desired brightness and depth of field. However, there's some unique considerations for drone photographers. First off, faster shutter speeds might result in darker images, so you'll need to balance this with your other settings. Many drones have fixed apertures, which means you can't adjust the settings to control the amount of light entering your camera. 
If your drone does have an adjustable aperture, opening it up will allow more light in, which can help in low light conditions. A wider aperture can also create a shallower depth of field, which can be used more creatively to focus attention on a particular area of the image. Now increasing the ISO can make your camera more sensitive to light, which can be useful in darker conditions. However, higher ISOs can also introduce more noise into your images, so it's generally best to keep the ISO as low as possible. Now just like in traditional photography, the histogram in drone photography is a useful tool for assessing your exposure. It can help you avoid overexposed or underexposed areas in your image. Remember the goal is to capture as much detail as possible in both the highlights and shadows of your image while also achieving your desired aesthetic effect. And as always, practice makes perfect. The more you fly and photograph with your drone, the more intuitive these settings will become. Well, that's about all I have for you guys for today. If you guys found this video helpful, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more content. Also, if you'd like to buy some of the merch I have for sale or some of the prints that I've made, be sure to give purplefinchphoto.com a visit. And as always, thanks for watching and happy flying.